And welcome everyone to another Smart Money Circle episode. I'm Adam Sarhan. With me today is Justin Henka, who's the CEO and co-founder of Mind Biotherapeutics. It trades in Canada with the ticker symbol MBIO. Justin, thank you so much for taking the time and welcome to the Smart Money Circle. Well, thanks for having me, Adam. Pleasure to be. So Justin, I always like to ask, can you please tell us your journey and how you got to where you are today, please? Sure. So by trade, I'm a an investment banker and, and I run a, a merchant bank. And so typically as a merchant and investment bankers in our businesses, we invest in and, and uh, curate um, uh, early stage uh, companies that um, are very research and, and development intensive um, and projects that sort of uh, are on the fringes and have the potential to change the world in some, some way. Uh, in particular, we like biotechnology, we like health sciences, uh, and we just like solving big global problems. And um, and we stumbled across a, a, um, a research that was being conducted in to the use of psychedelic medicines to treat mental health conditions. And as you and your viewers, viewers would know, uh, we, we have a you know a, a an escalating mental health crisis that uh, you know has been ineffectively being treated, um, arguably, and uh, has been escalated by the you know the um, the COVID crisis that we've just just experienced. And so the treatments aren't working in the way we'd expect them to. And really, we need we need a step change in uh, the treatments for conditions like depression and anxiety. Uh, and because simply because of the you know the costs burden to society, uh, the effect on families and communities um, and economies around the world, there hasn't been a step change in the treatments, the the medications that are used for treating depression since the introduction of Prozac in the in the early mid eighties, and so these new medicines, these psychedelic medicines, uh, they have a, a great a, a profound impact on the brain. Um, and uh, people's perception and thinking and cognitions, particularly when taking in large doses. Um, and, and our company is focused on using very small doses, microdoses of these medicines to treat these conditions. I love it. And then uh, we've had, interesting, because we've had some other companies on that do something similar to what you do. And I noticed with speaking with them that the downside tends to be the hallucinogenic aspect of it. And the upside is massive without that. How do you handle that, just out of curiosity? Yeah, so the, our thesis, our treatment thesis, and our investment thesis is to use very small doses. And the reason being is that we we know that in small doses we still see uh, profound impacts on on the brain and, and thinking, cognition, perception, and mood, uh, and improvements in depression. Since like, especially since um, conducting clinical trials with these substances. But the main uh, reason is that it's a, it's effective, but the use of microdoses is not uh, disruptive to a person's day to day routine, uh, yeah. and so that's really a great benefit. So if you want to take a large dose, a hallucinogenic dose, that needs to be supervised in a clin clinician's setting. Usually, two therapists would be be present, and and those therapies they they look to be very very effective, uh, and from the clinical trials that have been done to date. But then you know, arguably. The use of macrodoses of of hallucinogenic medicines is not a scalable way to treat um, the, these conditions, which are really, you know, affect you know upwards of you know twenty thirty percent of the population at any given time. Yeah, no, that definitely makes perfect sense. So just the microdoses, so they don't have that all the negative aspects of it. Uh, understood. So let's talk about your company. What do you do, and some of your competitive advantages, please, for those of them for, in the audience that aren't familiar. Yes, yeah, so we're a clinical stage biotechnology company, and we're using uh, our thesis is to use very small microdoses of psychedelic medicines. And these microdoses, they're not uh, hallucinogenic in nature, and we're using it specifically to treat depression. And uh, we're in a multiple phase two B clinical trials. We've had very positive data from a phase one and a phase two A depression trial. And uh, we're very excited to see what comes out of our phase two B trial, because after that, if we if we see positive data from phase two B uh, in depressed patients, you know, we're, we're, we're definitely onto something and uh, we can progress to phase three clinical trials and head towards commercialization of this drug. Oh, I love it. And then as far as a the TAM or the total addressable market, can you speak to that, please? And I'm assuming this is worldwide, not just in one country. Is that correct? Yes, it's a global audience. And and yes, the, the, these drugs are not approved really anywhere in the world for, for um, broad commercial use. And so it, it's, it's not so much a race to get there first, but certainly it's, it's a, 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 an adventure to prove that they work 
and that they're safe to use. They can be used safely and they they can be they're more effective than the medicines that are, that are currently being used. So currently uh, in Australasia, we, we're op- we're doing our clinical trials in Australasia. We're the only company in the world to have approvals for the take-home use of this type of psychedelic medicine, which is lysergic acid diethylamide, or LSD, or colloquially known as acid. So it's a it's a, a proprietary form of this drug that's been designed for safe take-home use by participants, and they're doing that, and we're, they're doing that safely and effectively uh, in the community as we speak in multiple phase 2B clinical trials. Oh, interesting. So it's using parts of LSD, but the good parts, if you will, to help fight depression. Is that more or less what? what yeah, it's, it's, it's been put into a form that, that can be safely used and can be used in microdoses and, and, and titrated and it can be dosed accordingly by individual patients uh, out in the community. And so we have to obviously take into consideration that this drug taken in larger doses is hallucinogenic in nature. So we have to have protocols in place to be able to monitor the dosing to ensure that people are taking the correct dose uh, to be able to to titrate the dose upwards or downwards based on the response that the particular patient has to the drug. Interesting. And then it's depression and anxiety, or are there other mental health issues that it helps as well outside of depression? Well, certainly the the there is a broad use case for this, but we're really targeting sort of the depressive disorders. But, um, we know from phase 2A trials and also in, in a large randomized controlled trials in healthy individuals that the tr- drug in microdosis has a profound impact on mood. So things like um, it makes you know, people feel happier. It gives people more energy. It makes feel, people feel more socially connected. It helps people sleep better. Uh, and these, this is from randomised control trials. And in a, a, a small depression trial, a phase 2A, which is the lead up to a phase 2B trial, uh, there was a substantial reduction in depressive symptoms in patients that, that are experiencing depression. Uh, we also are looking at, a, a uh, you know, whilst you, you, we may see, um, you know, up to 20% of the population um, in, in their lifetime or more experience a depressive illness, uh, we're also looking at using this drug to treat uh, conditions in women's health, and specifically uh, premenstrual syndrome and premenstrual dysphoric disorder, um, and those two uh, two conditions, particularly premenstrual syndrome, about twenty five percent of the global population of females will experience premenstrual syndrome, and the go to treatment for for that is uh, an antidepressant or hormonal treatments. But the the, the go to is generally an antidepressant medication, and the problem with antidepressant medications is is not that they're not effective. I mean, they're you know when they are effective, uh, they come with a whole host of side effects, and consistently people will drop out of using an antidepressant medication simply because of the the, the host of side effects that come along with it. And those side effects include things like um, sexual side effects and you know, impotence and loss of libido, um, weight gain. Um, and, and dry mouth and, and a whole lot of other uh, side effects depending on the medication that's been taken. So it's very common a reason why uh, patients with PMS or PMDD will, will, will um, cease using the medication. So a big part of you know, a medication being effective is actually, you know, will people continue to take it? And, uh, you know, and so that's, that's a big part of it, right? So, uh, yeah, so if you're treating people with depression, obviously it needs to be sustainable. And so what we've seen with this microdose of, um, of LSD, which we call MB22001, is that uh, it's very well tolerated and people can take it in their own time. Uh, they can dose flexibly. It's not taken every day and can be taken on days uh, where people can manage their dosage in, in, in ways that you know it enhance their lifestyle. We, we believe in the women's health trials that we've just had approval for. Uh, we're, we're looking actually for funding for those trials at the moment. And um, we, we the thesis there is that you can dose during specific phases of the menstrual cycle, um, during the problematic uh, phases of the menstrual cycle, which affect mood. Uh, and then you can stop the dose, the, the dosage of this drug. So you don't have to take it, uh, you know, 24-7, you know, 12 months of the, of the year. It's just during specific phases of the menstrual cycle that have a problematic effect on mood. Got it. No, that makes perfect sense. How about mm. the, uh, let's talk about risk. How do you handle risk and what are some mistakes you see people make with respect to risk management, either in your current role now or in your former role or concurrent role as investment banking side? Just risk as, risk management is a topic. I'm curious to know your thoughts on that. 
It's interesting. I think that you've, obviously there are the regu regulatory aspects of, of um, you know, the businesses that we run, and certainly there's a, there's a lot of risks that are, you know, when we're using these types of drugs and experimental uh, drugs of this particular business. Uh, but the risks, you know, are financial. They're obviously operational. Uh, there, there are key person risks and so forth. Uh, but the, the 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 way that we do this, and obviously we work really in the small cap um, space really here, and you know this this will either be a, a blockbuster drug, um, and or it won't. And so you know it, it will very quickly escalate once we see results from phase two B. Uh, but the way we operate and we manage risk is that you know we we run very tight knit teams. Uh, we all know each other very well. Uh, and management and senior personnel, including myself, are very engaged in, in every aspect of um, the operations of the business. So we, we do have very close oversight and um, very clear lines of communication, which I think is really probably the key to managing risk effectively. I love it. And then how about timeless lessons? What are some timeless lessons you've learned along the way that you'd like to share with the audience? Well, plenty of those, and uh, most of them are from the, you know, obviously the falling over and the failures. And uh, But I, I think the, the biggest the biggest lessons that I've learned really have got to do with uh, the way uh, that we pursue opportunities. And often I think like, like most entrepreneurs will have a great idea, we'll, we'll think about it, you'll write the business plan and you'll it'll, it'll, it'll get overanalyzed and overanalyzed. And we've learned in our businesses to act very quickly and to, to, to get on, jump on the bike, so to speak. We may not know how to ride it correctly. We may not know exactly where we're steering but we will jump at opportunities more readily um, than, than I would have in, in my younger days, certainly now because everything is moving so fast with technology, with AI uh, and so forth. So we test our ideas very quickly and then we either withdraw uh, or, or pursue them um, you know, very strongly once we have a clear idea of the potential of the, those projects. Got it. And then how about mistakes? What are some timeless mistakes you've learned along the way and how do you avoid them? Well, Thomas, well, what I think on the on the uh, the the other side of that continuum is really not acting quick enough, right? And uh, and procrastinating and overthinking and overanalyzing, and that's probably the, the the biggest mistake. And certainly in this day and age, you can't afford the the risk of um, of losing time. Um, but but then again, also you can't you know by moving too quickly, you can often miss things. So time is often our friend, uh, but I think we'd rather act, act quickly uh, rather than sort of delay. And uh, and miss opportunities. Nice. And then, as a leader, you're you. I'm I'm very interested here because not only are you a leader of MindBio, but you've also been in the investment banking role. You've seen leaders. What are some lessons you've learned about leadership? What makes a great leader? And anything else you want to share with respect to leadership? We'd say it with a please and thank you and a cherry on top. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, look. You know, I, I guess the the leaders that we certainly. Uh, of the CEOs and the management that we put in place into our, our portfolio companies. So uh, generally our investors like to see uh, one of our principals, i.e. myself or my business partner run our companies. So we do. So I'm the CEO of Mind Biotherapeutics. I'm, I'm on the board of several other public companies that we've curated and we've built and spun out of our investment banking operation. And uh, so the key people really need to be heavily engaged. They need to have a stake in the, in the companies. Uh, and we look for gray's knuckles, really. We look for, for CEOs and management that um, you know, have got experience in the particular domain that we, we we need them to have, often often the 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 most polished professionals are not the best for for this type of role. Uh, you know, running you know micro caps and bringing bringing projects out of the ground. Um, that's certainly a specialty that you know my business partner and I we 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 are we are, are experts at doing that and uh, at managing the risks early. So it requires a very much a, a you know hands on roll up the sleeves type approach to. To, uh, to 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 run in companies, we we generally won't hand over to professional CEOs until we're very very sure that we've got the right person and that the company's you know building a brand that's got some run, runs you know, it's got, it's got a run rate. Nice, very nice. And then, how about adversity? Obviously, to become successful, we have to learn how to overcome adversity. How 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 do you handle adversity, and what are some obstacles you had to overcome? I think um, you've got to be realistic as well. And one of the probably the biggest lessons I've learned is patience. And time, time is also uh, our friend. So um, problems that we see that, you know, problems come and go that often we see big problems arise. And um, I, I, I heard uh, Tom Hanks say recently, one of the best lessons he's ever learned is, you know, the quote, this too shall pass. Yes. And so most big, you know, crises that will happen in a, a company will, will pass if you just give it time and time to think it through. 
Um, so, so there's nothing really that's that's insurmountable. You know, obviously, you know, we've 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 had a really tough couple of years in uh, at the at the micro cap level, and so you know, fundraising and things are, are very very difficult. And um, so that's you know, I guess that's a test of patience. It's a test of the. Um, you know the type of businesses that we run now and that we pursue and we invest in are uh, are very unique. They've got something special about them, and I, I find that you know, like mine, Biotherapeutics, you know, this is a, this is a, a company that has a proposition that might change, uh, you know, the world in some way, and that it's going to help people with with depression and mental health disorders. And we certainly hope that it will, and that it will prove to be more effective than the current treatments that are available. And I guess if you've got a good asset. And uh, a good company, you know, the 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 money will flow, and uh, and the consumers will 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 flow flow to it. Got it. No, it makes perfect sense. And then I guess final question for you is, what's the best piece of advice you'd like to give the audience and or your thirty year old self? Well, I I think probably the best piece of advice I could give to uh, you know the younger audience is, uh, you know, eighty to ninety percent of success is just showing up and turning up and uh, turning up again and again and again. And if you do that enough and you repeat and rinse and repeat, um, you know, you, you've got a good chance of success. So uh, that's probably the, the the best bit of advice I could give to people. Obviously, you need talent. You need to work hard. You need to think and, and do the smart things, but show up. Got it. I absolutely love it. I think the uh, consistency theme, Justin, has been a major part of today's conversation where even with the medicine side of it, in order for it to be effective, it's got to be consistent, not just like a one and done working out. You got to do the setups consistently. You can't just do, you know, a hundred setups and be done. It's much better to do 10 a day forever. So that type of a thing. And part of being successful that 80% is showing up is keep showing up even in the face of adversity. Absolutely love it. Well, Justin, thank yeah. you so much for taking the time. And uh, how do people learn more about MindBio? Well, they can, they can see us at mindbiotherapeutics.com or they can look us up on the Canadian Securities Exchange with the ticket code MBIO. Beautiful. Well, Justin, thank you so much. Hopefully we'll have you on again soon. Thanks again, Adam.